okay, the next power source is wind power. And with wind power, we have a couple of different models of windmills. There's actually more than this, but these are just the two main ones. We have a horizontal model. And we have a vertical model. So the horizontal is more stable and efficient. And you see these with your big wind farms. The vertical is more versatile on homes. And it's actually not this big. So this is much bigger than this. This is really small and it can be put on a home. This is a lot bigger. And so these are not to scale. So I should put that down, not to scale. Okay. So the basic things here is that our blades are our turbines. And so over here, these are the blades here. So here's a blade, there's a blade, there's actually a third one right there too in the middle. Then you have the shaft is right here and the generator is here. On this model, you have the shaft is the whole thing here in the middle holding it up. And then at the bottom, you have the generator here. And um, this goes to a power grid, so most wind farms that use these big windmills are all connected together and they go to the power grid. Um, on occasion, you might see like one building and another in Europe, especially like one school is powered by one of these or something like that. But most of the time there's a big farm of them and they're all connected to the power grid. Um, wind energy can be stored in batteries. Um, when the wind's not blowing so let's talk about kind of the energy conversions here. You, so I'm just gonna write it in this space, a little small. So wind is kinetic energy. Which converts to mechanical energy. In the turbines. And we know the next one. Um, <clears throat> um, sorry, in the turbines and the shaft that spins. So the shaft spins, you need to know that. And this goes to electrical energy in the, and I'm just going to draw a line, in the generator. So we don't have to write it again. One thing you need to know with wind power is that you have no greenhouse gases and no air pollution. And that's really, really, really important. Okay, I know I'm going quickly, so you'll pause, pause the video as you need it to catch up. The next one is a geothermal power plant. And so let's use some colors to kind of help us figure out what this picture is. It's a side view of, um, uh, of, of land. So <clears throat> we have a rock layer here. So I'm using brown. I, should, I could use brown or black or gray to, to show a rock layer. And then here we have an aquifer. So our groundwater. And then down here we have magma. There are some places in the world where magma comes close to the aquifers. Not everywhere, but some places in the world. And then I'm just gonna draw some trees here because I'm just trying to show you that this is above ground and these lines are just the hills. So there could be like a person here on the hill. So um, this is above ground, this location. 
All right, now in these locations where magma comes really close to your aquifers, it actually heats up the aquifer and it makes that water hot. Aquifers are usually not just open spaces, but they have rocks and so water kind of fills in between the rocks. So I'm gonna put that here just so you kind of understand it's not like an underground river. All right, so this is our rock layer. This is our magma, and this is our aquifer. All right, so our aquifer. And so the water, the hot water and steam actually goes up. So we just heart, um, harness the power of the steam already. So we don't need to make steam by burning coal. We already have the steam here from this phenomena. So this can't be used everywhere because this doesn't happen everywhere. So we can't always just build a geothermal power plant because it only occurs in some locations. California has several of these um, in the mountain regions. Not that many, but a few. Iceland leads the world in this. So the hot water comes up and in here you have your turbine. That spins, so again, steam spins turbine, which is connected to a generator. So we have our turbine and generator. And then the generator um, sends power to the power lines, which then go to people's homes. Iceland does pretty much all its electricity this way because they're very geothermically active. And the water must go to a cooling tower and then it's pumped back down into the aquifer, the cool water, and then it's gonna heat up again from the magma. Okay, and so what comes out of the cooling tower? You have water vapor and you have some natural sulfur is underground. So we have some H2S gas. But if you put um, some scrubbers on here, it can get rid of that sulfur. This is called an injection well here, so it's going to inject the water back into the aquifer. And let's just put down here, the magma heats the water in the aquifer. So here there is no greenhouse gases, so it's very eco-friendly that way. And um, the only air pollutant is H2S gas, and that's not very much. And again, they can mostly get rid of that with scrubbers. So it's very eco-friendly, but it can, again, it can only be used in certain places on the planet. All right, now let's talk about a hydrogen power car. So this is not electricity. This is, well, it's an electric car, power, kind of. It's hydrogen power car, but it uses an electric motor. So our electric motor is here. Now, how do we get the electrons for the electric motor? So we have what's called a fuel cell. So let's sketch out a fuel cell. And you, you do need to know how a fuel cell works with the cathodes and anodes and things like that. So let's just kind of draw this like the, this. Pause the video as needed. And so over here, this side is called the anode and this side is called the cathode. Okay. And then this the whole thing here is a fuel cell, so I'm just going to write that up here, okay? And so this would be a hydrogen tank. So the hydrogen goes in here on the anode side. If we have any excess, it can go back to the hydrogen tank, so this would be excess fuel. And then we need oxygen, so air comes in here, which really we need the oxygen in the air to come in that side on the cathode, and then um, it's going to release water. So our 
only byproduct of a hydrogen fuel cell is water. The whole, um, this part here is electrolyte. So these are the basic parts of the fuel cell. So how it works is like this. In a fuel cell, So sorry. Okay, in a fuel cell, hydrogen is oxidized and electrons flow in a circuit to in the anode here. And then in the cathode, the electrons and oxygen combine to produce water and to power the electric motor. Um, all right, so because I sort of cut you off earlier, you may need to pause the video um, to catch up. In a um, hydrogen power car, the good parts here, there is no greenhouse gases and no air pollution. Um, in, um, from the fuel cell, But, but hydrogen needs to be made without fossil fuels to be sustainable. Okay, so we have a lot of fuel cell cars, we have fuel cell buses, they exist. Universities have them, engineering departments and um, car companies, they've made these cars, they run. But the problem right now is we do not know how to make hydrogen without using fossil fuels to split water to make hydrogen gas. We don't have a sustainable renewable way to make the hydrogen gas. And until we do that, this cannot be an answer to um, fossil fuel depletion or greenhouse gases or anything like that. So um, that is uh, one of the solutions. Some people are looking at algae as a, um, a way to make hydrogen um, gas. Um, so there are solutions out there. We'll continue with the next video.